tonight we want to say a pleasant good evening to everyone that's in the chat group we say welcome 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 hope you were able to print out your lessons if you were not able to print out your lessons just sit tight grab a pen grab your bible and jot down the concepts now friends we are we are saying that as we teach the present truth it's important that we go link after link in the prophetic chain and tonight we are going to dive right into the lesson our thematic text for this is first peter 1 12 a text that is very near and dear to us <clears throat> this text was precious to our pioneers they believed that they had the present truth and it was it was their god-given duty to disseminate to scatter these truths whether by preaching or by track to those who they came in contact with and you know it's like running a relay we got we are not on the final leg now and god has they have they had given us the batania and we don't want to drop we want to finish strong for the lord right every lesson we say it it must have an objective right and um tonight's objective is simple to clarify to, to, to clearly define the bible's position on the issue of death that's all we're seeking to do now tonight's lesson is a very very important lesson it's a lesson where the vast majority of people have it wrong um, and so we, we've titled it, tonight's lesson the other side of of the other side of, of death right and we're gonna look at death tonight now this is where we're gonna head we're heading brothers and sisters it's not just covering death because once you cover this topic as we've stated before there are some texts that they want to they would they would hope you can sh you can shed some light on such as the thief on the cross rich man, rich man and lazarus absent in body present with the lord uh, went to preach the spirits in prisons sold under the altar um so what we're going to do by the grace of god once we finish with this death study we're going to take probably a few sessions to cover those texts amen would you like that would that be a good thing? Amen. I praise God, right? So, because we want you to be ready to answer these parables, these texts that may allude to the fact that when you're dead, you're still conscious. Because again, your student will receive this lesson, but in their minds, they will have uh, lingering questions about these texts, which which their pastors have used to support the fact that the dead are still conscious or that the soul is immortal. So after this, we're going to take a few sessions just to go over these texts and just to give you, you know, some insights on them so you can be well-rounded when it comes on to the issue of death. Now, we're going to move right into our lesson. Now, every lesson we've, we've discussed must have an introduction. The introduction now serves, serves to introduce the lesson. Now, I think you want to please read now, right? There are so many varied beliefs on the subject of death. Suppose we take a survey with just one question. What happens when you die? Some, some would say your immortal soul is incarnated as something else. Others say there's an immortal soul that leaves the body and ascends to heaven if you've been good purgatory if you're not so good and hell if you've been really bad ask 10 people about death and you'll get 11 different answers but there are rock solid answers the bible provides sane sensible information revealing not only what happens when you die but also how to face death with hope and confidence all right so brothers and sisters again a very very important topic and i must say this not trying to be biased, but the only group of people who really, I believe, have this doctrine down to a science in its correctness are the members of the Seventh Heaven Church. The Jehovah's Witness also, they don't believe that the soul is immortal, but then they have, they, they're not clear on it. But the only church that I know right now that they're teaching in regards to death is the Seventh Heaven Church. And it's a doctrine that we need to understand. And I believe this is one of the doctrines that thousands will listen who will never hear words like these because in their churches they do not believe what the bible teaches and again it doesn't mean that they're that they're bad people it simply means that they have never been taught right um i used to believe where they believe where i used to stand where they stand but bless god look where i now stand right and we thank god for bringing us out of darkness even into this marvelous now we're going to move right into our lesson question number one says now what two things happen when man dies now Again, we want to simplify this lesson 
in its minuteness because again you're teaching this to people who don't have a long attention span they are biblically illiterate they aren't familiar with these concepts so our objective is not to sound smart our objective is to be simple right so we've tried to reduce this to its simplest forms so by the grace of God they can understand it and break loose from the traditions of man right now filling in now right what two things happen to man when man dies one the body turns to dust again that's the first thing that will happen right um, the body turns to dust or not the first thing but it will happen the, the, the body turns to dust now we want to fill that in now and we're going to Genesis chapter Genesis chapter 3 verse 19 look what the Bible says now Moses said now he says now this is the curse now placed upon Adam so it's good to give him the backdrop of a text don't just jump into a verse kind of give him the backdrop as what, what is happening right the curse on Adam now in thy sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground for out of it, it was taken for dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return brothers and sisters, here it is this is from the from this is from the, 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 the mouth of the Lord himself right that when man dies his body will eventually decompose and it will be brought back to the the very substance which it was made from right and one of the last words over your epitaph will be ashes to ashes and dust to dust I just did a funeral last week and one of the very last words I said over Ella Woodbine's casket and it <clears throat> gets some dirt and we, we said ashes to ashes and dust to dust right so the body <coughs> returns to dust and it is decomposed now one of the last thing that is I think one of the one of the last particles to be broken down is the bone <coughs> right here it's amazing here it doesn't it doesn't does it decompose yeah, yeah okay all right but yeah, the bone right now the second thing that will happen right is this now the spirit or the breath returns to God now this spirit is not the Holy Spirit right um, the spirit or the breath it returns to God who gave it now within this spirit it's not just it's your whole mannerism your your DNA your character your 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 individuality your your ideology <laughs> yeah whoever you are at death it returns to God and he holds it there until the resurrection right now here are some texts that we definitely want to consider Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse number 7 the Bible says now then shall the dust return to the earth as it was was and the spirit shall return to God who gave it so there is a separation and we got to get this because you know the average person you know the, the, you know what I tell you boy the devil has another number on Christianity right but the spirit it returns to God who gives it in Ecclesiastes verse 3 chapter 3 verse 19 and 20 Solomon says now for that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beast even one thing befalleth them as one dieth so the other dieth yea they have all one breath so that man hath no preeminence over the beast for all is vanity and all goeth to one place all are dust and to dust they return again so they all so, so the breath the breath or the spirit it goes back to God who gives it immediately when a man dies he doesn't hover around to see what's gonna happen once you are pronounced dead that spirit it just it goes back I don't know who carries it I don't know how it's transported we're not gonna get into that kind of that theology but this I do know the Bible says it returns to God who gave it where does he have it I don't know I've never been there but I can tell you he it is preserved and and and, and ere long that spirit will be reunited with the exact body which it came out of right no please read now when God made Adam let, let's see how God made Adam now when God made Adam when God made Adam he breathed the spirit or breath of life into his nostrils and he became a living soul Ecclesiastes 12 7 says the exact opposite occurs at death then the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it what goes back to God the spirit or breath the Bible never says the soul 
goes back to God. And the spirits of all mankind, good or bad, saint or sinner, Hitler or Mother Teresa, go back to God in the death process. You got to get this thing. A, it doesn't say that only the spirit of the righteous goes, goes back to God. The spirit goes back of every person, whether wicked or bad, saint or sinners, it goes back to God and he holds it. The body is returned back to the earth and by and by it will be decomposed. Friends, you're going to have to rivet these things in your student mind so they get the concept. Yeah? All right, note now, since the dust returns, go ahead now, to the earth as it was presumably... Right. Since the dust returns to the earth as it was, presumably the breath or spirit returns to God as it was. Adam's breath was not conscious before creation. Why assume it's conscious after death? Mm -hmm. The word of God precludes any idea of consciousness after death. Psalms 146.4 says when the word or spirit comes from the same root as other words pertaining to breath, or breathe in, such as inspire or respiration. The Greek word for spirit is pneuma, mm -hmm. which gives us words like pneumonia, the respiratory disease. Job 27.3 tells us where the spirit is. All the while, my breath is in me, and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. Now watch this now, saints now. When a man dies, the breath of God or the power of God that speaks of life returns to him. James 2, 26 says now, the body without the spirit is dead. Even today, when we, even today when we mean he's dead, we say he expired, yeah? Or he breathed his last breath, yeah? The body without God's breath is dead because at death, God's spirit or his breath goes back to him. When man was created, his body was first formed of the dust. Then God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living, thinking, feeling, active being. Note, God called Adam a living soul. He did not exist before, right? When, man, when a man dies, the simple opposite, the simple opposite of the creative power takes place. Says the Bible, his breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, possession. In that very day his thoughts perish. And I like what the original says, in that very day his thoughts pause. Because you must understand it's a pause. And you gotta get this friends that whatever state you die on, whatever's on your mind at death, when the resurrection takes place, it just unpause, it just resumes because there's no change in death, right? The breath of the, or the spirit of life of all man, good or bad, returns to God. God also takes, it, takes back the breath of animals. As we have read, Solomon rejects the theory that man's spirit goes upward and the beast spirit goes downward, friends. These are not scriptural. And again, these are things that have been inundated in Christianity and the vast majority of people believe that when you die, you are not unconscious, but conscious. Now, now question number two now, now is man conscious in, in death? Now, is he conscious? Now, I want you to consider these four talking points. Is man conscious in death? Now, question one now. In that day, fill it in now, the Bible says, in that day, in the, in, sorry, in, in that very day he's died, his thoughts perish, or we say his thoughts pause. And I like the word pause and perish. It's the same thing. But pause means you don't go forward, you don't go backward. And once you unpause it, it picks right back up. Emphasize these things, brothers and sisters, right? Psalms 146, verse 4, David says now, His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish or pause. Now think now. And, I, and, and this is where you have to use your sanctified imagination. I always like to you know, use analogies. Here's a man who goes out to rob a bank. And when he goes in the bank now, he says, hands up, stick it up. And in the process of robbing the bank, or uttering those words, he dies. He gets shot and he dies. When that man is resurrected, friends, the next thought, will, what would be on his mind is not him sitting somewhere in Honolulu, sipping pina colada, you know what I'm saying? Or him sitting in church, waving his hands. 
brothers and sisters, the, the thing that will resume was, give me the loot, give me the loot, because that was what he died thinking about, yeah? His thoughts paused, and if you die with Jesus, you are raised with Jesus, yeah? And that is where we have been, we have been counseling and admonished to go to your rest at night with every sins confessed. Go to your bed with Jesus on your mind, saints. And if it is not, if it's not God's will that you should wake in the morning, at least you know you've died in Jesus, and when you're awakened, your thought process will, con will, will, will resume, yeah? So in that very day, his thoughts perished. Second point now, the dead know not anything. These are some valid points we need to highlight from Scripture. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5 and 6 there. And these are two texts that we are told that we are to. We should commit these. We are encouraged and admonished that we should commit these two texts, these two verses to memory. And not just commit it, we are to make, make it be a part of our very being. We are to know this because this text saved many from going off into delusion. And this text, as you're going to see as we close, will be the, the anchorage that will keep God's people when the devil appears as Jesus Christ and bring a litany of supposedly religious deities who people believe are not dead. Right? Now, Ecclesiastes 9, 5, the Bible says now, the dead says now, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not what? Anything. Brothers and sisters, the dead don't know anything. They don't know who's winning the NBA team. They don't know who, 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 know, who, who they don't know who, who's, who's going to win the next Europa League. They don't know who's winning the, f the dead know anything. They don't know anything. They are unconscious of their surrounding. Right? We have to emphasize this. Therefore, they can't give you advice. They can't give you direction. They can't tell you what tie to wear. They can't tell you if you look good in your suit or not because they do not know anything. And I tell people this, brothers and sisters, that one of the safest places on planet Earth, one of the, should be prime real estate, is a graveyard. Because everybody there is dead. That's the safest place. I've never, I've never seen a dead man rob a person. And if a dead man tell you to, to catch a bus, you better get run. You know what I'm saying? They don't give advice, right? Thirdly now, thoughts to consider now, their feelings also perish. Their feelings also perish. Look at verse 6 of Ecclesiastes chapter 9. He says, now also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. They can't hate you. They can't love you. Yeah? They can't console you. And listen, that dead person don't feel no, uh, he doesn't feel cold in the grave. He doesn't feel afraid in the grave. No, he doesn't, brothers and sisters, he doesn't have any feelings. And I tell you this, these are things you want to emphasize. Listen, if the man didn't get you when he was dead, alive. sorry, the man didn't get you when he was alive, thank you. When you're dead, you're off the hook. You see, I've never seen a dead man get revenge. It's the living that you are to fear, not the dead, brothers and sisters. The most wanted man right now on the FBI, most wanted list, is not a dead man. It is a living man. Why is it then that we fear the dead more than we fear the living? It is so true, brothers and sisters. I, I remember, but I tell you so, I remember when my, my, my uncle, my uncle had passed. And, you know, he had cancer and he hid it. And so it just came on like, a, like an avalanche. And I remember we went on to my mother's home and, you know, he was there. And we were bringing him back now to St. Thomas. And by the time we got to, I think, Seaford, he expired. Yeah? Now, my brother is a Rasta. <laughs> I tell you something, boy. So, obviously, we were in two cars, and I was in one car, and, you know, I said, thank God I wasn't in the car that he died because, brother, you have to stop that car and get me out of that car. That's the phobia that we have been so duped to believe, right? And, but I'm telling you something. When we brought him to, to, to his house, and we laid him, no, we, they laid him <laughs> on the, on the bed and they, you know, in his room. 
and you know you, you die in Jamaica, boy. You call the you call the, the po police. They're not in no rush because you're already dead. It's like they're taking their own sweet time. And so finally, we were wondering if they would ever get the man out because night is coming. I'm tired, but well, we says even though I know this, yeah. Uh, even though as I'm, I'm a baptized Seventh-day Adventist Christian and I teach in the back of my mind, I didn't feel comfortable sleeping in a house with a dead man. And not because you think, you think, you think I had it bad. My brother, who's a Rasta man, he said Rasta, and he was dead. And finally, even after the body was removed from the house, my body, I felt a little safer. My, my, my brother had a phobia. That Rasta man drove from St. Thomas all the way back to Spanish Town. A two hour ride. And back then the roads were new, nowhere near condition. Because of the belief system, my brothers and sisters. You see. But they don't have any feeling. And we have to emphasize they don't give advice. They don't get they don't they, 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 they don't they don't get revenge. They can't console you. They don't know what you're doing. And friends, it is it is it is it is a it is a myth. You have to drive listen, this is a text. This is a teaching. Drive this home in their mind. Ask God to give you sanctified illustrations how to milk this text. Right? Because again, this text will, will, will be worth more than even your pension, right? Now. Fourthly now, the, the dead praise not the Lord. These are some powerful things you want to emphasize, right? Very simple, but to the point. Psalms chapter 1, 15, verse 17. David says now, the dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down in silence. They don't, the, the dead don't say amen. They don't say hallelujah. They don't say thank you, Jesus. They don't say well. They don't say come on now. They don't say make it plain, make it plain, preacher. Tell the truth. They don't, they don't do that. And that's why, friends, if you're going to praise the Lord, praise Him while you're alive. If you're going to accept Christ as your Savior, you need to make a move while the blood is running warm in your vein. Emphasize this thing because once you're dead, we don't care how much holler and moan and groan or how, or, or how big the wreath is. They can't rejoice. The dead praise not the Lord, brothers and sisters. If you're gonna make, and if you're going to make your move for, for Jesus, the Bible says, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Yeah? Make your move. The dead don't praise the Lord. You know what I'm saying? They don't rejoice when souls get baptized. They don't rejoice. They do not praise the Lord. Emphasize these things, right? And that, 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 and, and that anything else is a deception, right? Note, this, please read the scriptures are, are plain, right? The scriptures are plain. When death comes, all thinking and feeling end. If they do not, the Bible is false and unreliable. Thinking and feeling did not exist before God breathed life into man. And they stop entirely when the man dies. There it is, right? Most of the Christian world today. Most of the Christian world today believes that when a person dies, they immediately go to heaven. If that is so, then why does the Bible say the dead do not praise the Lord? They are not praising the Lord because they are sleeping in their graves. When you really think about this, this makes the most sense. Let's suppose that tragedy strikes a young married couple. And look at this scenario now, right? These are good analogies to use or you can use others, right? Right? I tend to use the opposite of this one when I preach, but it's a good, it's, it's the other side of the coin, right? The husband... The husband dies in a car accident, and he is immediately in heaven. After a while, the wife remarries, and her new husband abuses her physically. Would heaven be a place of joy and bliss for her former husband? Absolutely not. In fact, it would be torture for him to watch what is taking place with his wife. God's way is the only way that makes rational, logical sense. We sleep in the graves, and our next conscious thought is the coming of Jesus. All right. So, friends, use these analogies. You know, I tend to use the analogy of the opposite, that he, he, you know, he doesn't abuse her, but, you know, he loves her, and then, you know, you see the pictures removed from the wall, and the children are calling him daddy, and all of a sudden now he wants to change their name. And, and, and can you imagine you in heaven saying, I, 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 I know he's not going to do that. You, I really, I, you know, that, that gift I bought you, and he's just moving all your stuff out of the house that you bought and moving his stuff in. Isn't that right? Hey, all the pictures you had are moved. 
heaven would not be a happy place. And that's why God, God ever would be a, a jealous place, a very depressing place. Yeah? So whether you use the tragedy or the op opposite side, use these illustrations to emphasize the fact that it could, why would God do that? No, that's why God, you know, at death, you do not know. And I thank, I thank a wise God for doing that because this heaven would, have been, would be a very depressing, right? And a very melancholy place, right? All right, number three now. Now, at creation, was man endowed with an immortal soul? Now, this is where the controversy all starts from. So you need to, you need to clarify this. You know, and we're going to look at now who has immortality. You know, is, is immortality condition, conditional? Did man have immortality at creation? Is man's soul immortal? Who has immortality? Because if we can rightly clarify the whole misconception about immortality, friends, I believe it will be clear in your student's mind, right? So at, at, at creation, did man have immortality? No, brothers and sisters, he did not, right? How do I know? Look what the Bible says in Genesis 2, 7, right? It says now, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living soul. Look at this text now, right? Please read now. It doesn't say. It doesn't say God put a soul into man, but man became a living soul, a living being, a living person, as modern translations put it, for that's what the text means. The Bible never says a person has a soul as if it were a separate entity we possess. I don't have a soul. I am a soul, a living creature, a person, and so are you. The next question that arises is, can a soul die? All right. The word? The word mortal means subject to death and immortal means the opposite, imperishable. You don't find the term immortal soul or immortality of the soul even once in the entire Bible. The Word of God doesn't teach such a concept. The Bible often uses the expressions soul and spirit, but never attaches the term immortal to either word. We have the promise of immortality as a gift bestowed when Jesus returns. All right, so friends, listen. When we deal with the word mortal, you need to use your imagination. What does mortal mean? Mortal means subject to death. Mortal means wear and tear. Mortal means your teeth begin to shake. Mortal means your teeth fall out. Mortal means your hair fall out. Mortal means your eyes, you, you need glasses, yeah? You shake, you tire easy. These are signs of mortal. Mortal means you can die. And my brothers and sisters, for all those who are online, if God does not work a miracle to preserve us or keep us alive, we're going to die. That's what mortal, mortal means. And you're never going to find the word an immortal soul or immortal spirit. Those two words do, do, do never, um, you never find them together in the Holy Scripture, right? Now, all right now, so let's look at the word. And so we get immortality at the second coming. The Apostle Paul says that he seeks for immortality. Now, friends, think about it now. If he says, I'm seeking for immortality, if I say to you, I am, if I have my glasses on my face, I'm not seeking for them. So why would a man seek for something he already possesses? It doesn't make any sense. We look for it to mortality. We get immortality at the second coming of Jesus. Right now, we is mortal. Right? That's what it means. Right? Note. In fact, the very word immortal is used only once in the scriptures. And at this point, you can even ha ha have your student turn to the text, right? 1 Timothy 1 verse 17 says, applies the, applies the word not to man, but to the only wise God, immortal. Immortality is a phrase, a word that is only attached to the Godhead. It's never attached to humanity, right? The same epistle clinches that point. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16 says now, where 
the inspired theologian Paul explicitly declares the king of kings, the lord of lords, the only, the one has immortality. So you're not going to find the two texts that are, that, that are used to deal with immortality. They, they say it is attached to Jesus. We get immortality at the second coming of Jesus. There is not an immortal soul on earth today. Not even cats are immortal. As a matter of fact, I would dare say there's nothing on earth is immortal. Everything will be fretted by the tooth of time. You give that building that, that <laughs> as a matter of fact, I tell you something that, that's so hilarious. So, you know, down, down, down there in Jamaica, you know, I tend to you know, try to leave some stuff down there. So when I go, I don't have to be, be bothered with, you know, be encumbered, you know, with, encumbered with the, um, the, 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 the hassle of, you know, bringing this to the airport. So I tend to leave um, a pair of shoes. So I, I got a nice pair of Aldo shoes from Ross, all right? And, okay, and so I left them there. And whenever I go to church, I wear them. The other day I went down there to put my shoes on and friends, because my shoe was mortal, I took it up and I, I was kind of doing some kiwi and I noticed the leather or the pleather, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This came off in my hand. And friends, I was so upset because I only probably wore those pair of shoes probably like four or five times. And the Lord said, sir, if you're right, you need to you, you store them up. You need to give somebody, to give somebody them. But literally, because, so my shoes was, I have a mortal shoes. And everything is mortal. So what, what do I do now? I'm forced to bring a pair of shoes with me back and forth because I'm not going to leave my mortal shoes because I paid some, some good mortal money, you know what I'm saying, for that. You know what I'm saying? So nothing is immortal, brothers and sisters. No house, no camera. Everything that man has made has an expiration date. And because of sin, things just, some things wear and tear. But my point is, use these illustrations so your students can really get the concept down of be between mortal or immortality, right? Now, question four now says now, to what do the Bible writers liken death? If we were to compare death to something, what, and even we compare that death to this, it is still not an accurate depiction, comparison. But this is the closest we tend to compare death to, right? Now, Psalms chapter 13, verse 3, this is what the Bible writers compare death to. David says, Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. So death is compared to sleep. Right? Now, you know, honestly, uh, well, well, let me read more text. First Kings chapter 2. Again, look at David now. And David spoke more of death and sleep than anything else. Right? And First Kings chapter 2, verse 1 and 10. Look what David says now, right? David says this now. Now, the Bible says now, now the days of King David drew nigh that he should die. His breath goeth forth. Yeah? His body goes back to the earth. Yeah? And he charged Solomon his son, saying, skip on to verse 10 now. So David what? Slept. Slept. There it is. With his fathers and was buried in the city of David. There it is. David likens death as a sleep. So the answer is he likens it as a, it is a dreamless sleep. Right? Now, you know, honestly, now friends, I, I, you know, you, you've heard me say it before. I, I do have a phobia of death and dying. And, I, and I've always said it, friends, you know, I really don't want to die. I, I'm, I'm praying that the good Lord will, will favor me to be one of those who are alive when Jesus comes. I really pray. And because I know that when you, when you die, you don't know anything, but it's the pain that the living suffer. And because, you know, as a, as a pastor, as an evangelist, doing, I've done so many funerals and been to so many funerals. And I see the void and the vacancy and that, that just that, that, you know, that emptiness that is left, you know? And so, so one day I was, you know, I, I don't know what I was doing, but I was I'm doing something and I said, okay, let me just see what death would be like. 
And so I, I laid in my bed and I put my hands, right? And I tried to take a picture, but again, obviously my, my hand was moving to see, it's asleep. Friends, it is really like it as a sleep. But even in a sleep, there is still motion. There, but what happens is it's the unconsciousness. You see, and that's why the Bible writers liken it as a sleep, because even in sleeping, you're still, there's inhale, exhale, right? And, and you dream. Some of you have nightmares, right? Some of you talk in your sleep. Some of you snore heavily, yeah? But the point of the matter is that the, because of man's unconsciousness, because when you're asleep, you don't know what's happening. And some of us sleep so dead, man, your, man, your house could burn down, you wouldn't even know. You know what I'm saying? That's why they like necessity, because there is no consciousness of what are even cognizant of what is going on, right? No, the Bible teaches that death is a sleep, is but a sleep at last until Christ's second coming. More than 50 times, Bible writers constantly describe death as a sleep. Death is not the end of the road. It is a dreamless sleep in the arms of Jesus for the righteous. Emphasizes, friends, asleep, right? And there is no consciousness when a person is asleep. So in death, he or she is, 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 is ignorant of what is transpiring in their, around their surroundings, right? Now, number five, again, friends, we're, we're, trying, we're trying to make this very, very simple because, again, it can be, become very technical, right? Number five now, right? Can the dead communicate with the living? I want you to consider these three points, right? The dead know not anything about their own children. Fill this in. The dead know not anything about their own children. One of the most pathetic things. And friends, I, we drive past, I drive past the seminary, cemetery. I say cemetery? <laughs> Let me back that up. I drive past the cemetery <laughs> several times. And you imagine the amount of money is wasted every year. You think of Mother's Day right now. If you were to go to the cemetery tomorrow, the amount of people brought flowers and visit the tomb, the grave of their mother, it is unbelievable. And it's just so pathetic. It is pathetic because what happens, nobody, their mother does not know that she's getting these flowers. You should give your mother the flowers when she's alive, not when she's dead, when she can smell them. Yeah, very, very pathetic. And the demons chuckle, and it, it must break the heart of Jesus. As a matter, here's a text now. You say, where is that? Job chapter 14, verse 21. Job says, his sons come to honor him. His sons, grandsons, yeah? Comes to honor him. Comes to honor. Who's, and he knoweth it not. Who is the he? The man in the grave. Look what it says, Nathan. And they are brought low. I've seen people sit down, bring lunch, snacks, cookies, juice boxes, water, sit down at their, that, that, that grave, and they're holding a, com a, a conversation with the dead. It is very, very disturbing. Very, very disturbing, brothers and sisters. Right? But what? But he perceives it not that is he does he or she does not know whether you graduate nursing school whether you whether you pass the bar whether johnny got healed whether tom got deported or, or whether the cat is friend they, 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 they don't know and and and, and i want to caution people let me sound a word of caution as a matter of fact a couple years ago one of the, one of my members he, he, he came to me and asked me for, for my input on a, on a, on a, on a tradition that, that his siblings hold. So every year, all the siblings would go and visit the mother's grave site. And these are, Advent, these are grown Adventist children. These are men and women, right? And he refuses to go every year and so he says to me you now not i mean you know what do you think i said nothing to think about him <laughs> saying it's nothing to think about so i said to him what if one of these days you go and you see someone like your mother up here what would you do he said we would run i said precisely don't even go go don't even go near anything 
Now, I'm not saying, brothers and sisters, listen, I don't want to become fanatical. I'm not being fanatical. I know people go to their parents' grave and sometimes, you know, out of respect, they, you know, the Bible talks about how the Pharisees would, would whitewash the pulka. They would whitewash the tombs, yeah? And so, yeah, some tombs may be run down by the heat and the, the paint may chip. And I'm not saying if a man goes here and paint his, his, his mother's tomb, yeah, and that, even that itself is questionable. But, you know what I'm saying? But it's not like she's in there thanking you that, yo, I thank it you beautified my tomb. You know what I'm saying? And we see in cemeteries, it's because of a, a, it's more of a, they want the place to look good. So once a year, they come and they just whitewash all the tombs because, okay, fine, it's a graveyard. You know what I'm saying? But for us to expend money year after year, flying, bring people in to go to our parents, and I would discourage anybody who is bringing anybody together to go revisit the dead friends. It is, it, I've seen it all the time, and if these people knew the dangers that they're putting themselves into, they would stop it. Yeah? Now, I know this may seem hard, but friends, it's, it, it, it's a reality. Right? So, so the, dead, the dead knows nothing about their children. Second point now, the dead have no part in any earthly affairs. They have no part in any earthly affairs. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 6. The Bible says now, also their love and their hatred and their envy. They do not give advice. They don't encourage. They need to discourage. They can't tell you what stocks to buy. Yeah? Or whether you should buy some of the Bitcoin. Yeah? Or get on whatever. They don't give advice. Right? And neither are they are a part of any of the earthly affairs. Friends, and these are things that are being taught in Christendom, unfortunately. Right? Thirdly now, God condemns attempts to communicate with the dead. Hmm. And that is why I, 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 I strongly discourage people from even going to even a family member graveyard, cemetery, tomb, and have any kind of conversation. No kind of dialogue. Like I said, if you're going to the paint, the, okay, you're going to brush up and weed, okay, whatever. You know what I'm saying? I understand, but to, to, to bring family members from near and far, we wanna, we're going to celebrate our mother's 21st anniversary of being dead. And you go there and you're talking and you're singing. Friend, what are you doing? What are you doing? These things are very, very offensive to God, and, we're, and, we, and we have been discouraged. As a matter of fact, in the book of Ecclesi, in the book of Deuteronomy 18, a good text to note, the Bible says this now, um, they were going into the land of Canaan. Now, the Canaanites, they believed that the soul, was Im, the soul was immortal, that there's life after death, and they had a whole bunch of weird beliefs. And God is saying, as you are entering this land, I caution you, be aware of this practice. And here it is now, right? When thou art coming, and friends, again, you want to have your student, especially, you want to have them read these texts, highlight them, circle them, even focus on the words. Expound upon the words, milk the text. You know what I'm saying? You know how you eat orange? Let me tell you how Jamaicans eat orange. Well, you know, you see, some people are stoosh. When we eat orange, we pee that orange. And when we, we juice that orange, we juice the orange, we juice it, you juice it, and then you peg it. Peg the text, peg the words, milk the words, right? When thou art come in the land which the Lord giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of, what are the abominations of the nations now? Here it is now. Thou shalt not make, there shall not be found among you, sorry, there shall not be found among you one that maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or even useth divination, or an observer of times. These are people who believe that the horoscopes uh, orchestrate, you know, the, their destinies, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or the last one is a necromancer. That's seeking to communicate with the communicate with the with the um with the dead. Remember that movie that came out, Ghost? Use an analogy with Patrick Swayze and Denise Moore and Whippy Goldberg, Goldberg, right? She, used, she was a convient, a necromancer. And, and, and listen, friends, that movie, because it appeals to the emotions, 
Here's a man, he died prematurely. The wife misses him. And, 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 and the music they use, boy, if you, I'm telling you, that's a move you. And it's one of the number one gross movies of all times, brothers and sisters. You see, communicate with the dead. And more and more is being done. Look what Jesus says now about these things. He says now, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. These things are an abomination. So we do not encourage any form of communication with the dead, with the visit, no grave, none of that stuff. X me out. Yeah? That's not going to work, right? Note, the Bible says no to the question before us. Attempting to communicate with the dead are considerable, considered by God uh, of, of, of deviling into abominations. According to the Bible prophecy, spiritualism is to have a great revival in these last days, but it is not of God. And you're, we're, what we're seeing now, that more and more movies are coming out with with spiritism, the cartoons, it's even in the commercials, it's everywhere. And the, the foundation of spiritualism is the concept that the dead can communicate with you. And so we want to discourage our, our, your student to depart from these things. If they have these movies in their homes, get them out. They're an abomination. Yeah? And, and, and you go back in the Bible, abominations were burnt. This encourage them to not to be affiliated with anything that borders on even on the on the on the, on the hinges of spiritism, communication with the dead, and even reading books that delve with this the occult. Yeah? There's a lot more we can say, and we may do something, we may do something on the occult in this in, in this series. Who knows, right? But stick with us, right? And so we, we, we want to emphasize this, friends, right? That, 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 that we, should be, we, should, we should stay clear of these things. Now, number six now. Why does the devil want us to believe, want us to be confused about what happens after death? You see, the devil is getting, as a matter of fact, the Bible says in Revelation 12, verse 9, that, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Friends, tonight, the whole, except for the faithful members in God's true church who believe this thing. The, the whole world have been deceived and duped in, during, in the concept of what happens to you when you die. Everybody believes that when you die, you are ushered in the presence of Jesus, enjoying the bliss of heaven, looking over the thresholds, looking down at heaven, on earth. Everybody believes that. And again, it's so silly because, you know, they, they, they say that when you die, you go to heaven, and the same man will go and preach a preacher resurrection. So, and, and, and remember, the, 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 the spirit cannot, um, the spirit and the breath cannot coexist apart from each other and the body. You need them, the breath and the body. So the spirit is not up there by itself just, you know, hanging out. No, it has to be united. Right now, the devil is getting ready to pull off one of his greatest deceptions of all time. This one takes the cake. And the foundation for his deception lies in the context of getting the whole world believe that when you're dead, you are not really dead. Please read on. It is a... It is on this very point that the devil will deceive billions of people. If people do not know the biblical truth about death then they will believe a lie and be deceived when the devil transforms himself into an angel of light. Imagine, if you will, all the pictures you have ever seen of Jesus. Long hair, handsome, tall, and so forth. This is the image that people have in their mind when Jesus is mentioned. Suppose you are watching your high-definition television one evening, and all of a sudden there is an interruption. A news anchorman is seen at his desk, and he gives the following news report. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> here is the latest news report. Jesus Christ has returned. This is the most glorious news that the world has ever heard. He is in Berlin, Germany right now, speaking to large crowds of people, quoting scripture and healing all the sick that are brought to him. Mercy. 
The message that he is bringing to the masses is that all are saved if they simply listen to the teachings of the church and do exactly as the church says. What if the disciples of Jesus also appeared and gave the same message? Many would be led astray at this time. It will be the crowning act of the devil to deceive as many as possible. Now, friend, this is FYI. This is just for your information only. We know, brothers and sisters, that we are anticipating the passing of a national Sunday law, the mark of the beast, the amendment of the Constitution, an oppressive law, a strange act. It is called on the various titles in the spirit of prophecy. Now, one of the things that will take place at the passing of Sunday law, it is Satan's greatest deception. I remember when I used to watch magic and one of my greatest one of my favorite magician was David Copperfield. And he was an illusionist, yeah? And I remember one time now, he was about to make the, um, he was about to make the, the, the Statue of Liberty disappear. And prior to that, he had made a, a rabbit disappear. He had made a man disappear. And, 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 and he was about now to make the Statue of Liberty disappear. Friends, I was hooked to my television. As a little boy, I was, I, I think I was at BA in high school, yeah? And friends, when they did the lights and boom, you looked out there in the harbor, it was gone. Now friends, deep in my mind, I had sense to know that he did not really, that the Statue of Liberty was still out there in the harbor. It was an illusion, but it worked. And I say to myself, if David Copperfield can do this, what will the devil do when he appears? And friends, I'm telling you, and that is why we are told if there's one doctor, she says, I saw the saints must understand present truth. They must understand the state of the dead. And she quotes Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 and 6. She says that the, the, the spirits who may appear to them, they must, they must use this text to fight against it. It's a powerful text. And it's not just, oh, I'm going to quote this text while I'm watching the devil's movies. No. You know, and some of us really believe, you know, we're so duped to think that, you know what? You open the Bible to Ecclesiastes 9.5 and leave it open in your home. That's going to ward off demons while you're watching demons on the television. Huh? And you have a demonic attitude. No. So you, we, we must, yes, we must quote the text, but more so our lives must be in harmony with the life of Jesus Christ. There is no power in the Bible by itself. There is no power. Because friends, I'm telling you something. I've, I've been in homes where people, they, boy, they listen to all kind of ungodly music and they, open, they always go to the Psalms and burn incense. And think because they open a Psalms and they burn some incense all of a sudden, that's going to ward off demons. Man, you need to think again, man. So what happens now? At the Sunday law, friends, we are told this. And what is the foundation of it? Is that all these groups, we're told, friends, that when the Sunday law passes, he will bring all back almost every heathen deity. Now think about it now. Most of these deities are, have birthed powerful religious groups, right? And each of their followers believe that when that these deities are not dead, most of them don't even believe in, are not even Christians. And this is the ace that the devil will use to bring them over into Christianity and to have them avow and affirm a wrong day. We are told, brothers and sisters, that look what happened now. She says, in evangelism, at the Sunday law, she says, as we near the close of time, earlier evangelism 705, there will be a greater and still external parade. What's a parade? Huh? You ever been to a parade? It's, a, it's, 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 it's a, a moving scenery, right, of heathen power. Heathen deities will do what? Will manifest their single powers and exhibit themselves before the cities of the world. This is a prophecy that the spirit of prophecy has predicted. And she's quoting um, Thessalonians where, where Paul says now, and even the devil himself is transformed into an angel of light. And friends, could you imagine, you know, all these, could you imagine you're out there, brothers and sisters, and, 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 and you see Mary appears, and she's appearing everywhere also. I may talk about that one too. You see, friends, the stage is being set, 
and the only group of people who can interrupt or disrupt this are the members of God's true church. But what are we doing? Like, like, like Caligula, we, we're trifling when we ought to be struggling. Huh? We're collecting seashells. We ought to be teaching these things to our neighbors and studying it. You see, friends? Right? That's what we should be doing. Right? Now, so this is, this is something that's going to happen. And the only thing that will keep you and I is our faith in Jesus and our understanding of what happens to a person when he dies. Listen, the average person, when this takes place, is gone. Could you imagine the Rastafarians, Haile Selassie, say, Hail Ethiopia, little old short man. And by the way, the, the, and, and the economy is going to be perfect. And he goes to Bubba Hill, the 12 tribe, you know, Nati, whatever who they are, Orthodox, and say, I am, I am Emperor Haile Selassie. The Sabbath is now changed from Saturday to Sunday. Haile, Haile King. What do you think the Rastafarians are going to do? They're going to jump ship. Well, they, they, they were never on the ship, but they're going to go into, even into deeper delusion because the Rastafarians and many others believe that when you die, em Emperor live it every time. You see these, these songs they sing, Jah can't die, and their version of Jah is not Jah as David wrote Jah. This is their version of Jah. You see, brothers and sisters, and this doctrine has been inundated in almost every religious group out there except for the remnant church. Have mercy, right? So, friends, we have to be very, very careful, right? That we don't fall into, let me, let me see where we're at, right? Okay, so definitely he wants to deceive us. Now, as we bring it to a close now, brothers, question number seven now. In regards to death and dying, what is our only hope? Friends, tonight our only hope lies in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ being that wave, sh wave sheathed. Sheathed? Yes. First fruit. And because Christ rose from the dead, brothers and sisters, there is hope tonight for all those who sleep in Jesus. Amen. Paul says, if Christ be not risen, then our living, our dying will have been in vain, brothers and sisters. You see? And every dead person, they will remain in the grave until Jesus comes. And we know that there are several resurrections. We know this. Of course, you wouldn't tell them that. There is a special for the remnant. We know this. And we know every seventh day Adventist who, who, who have died faithfully in the message will rise in that one. The ones that were playing church are getting up in the second one. And by the way, let me just say it. No seventh day Adventist will rise in the first resurrection. None. That's not for us. You should know this. I hope you do, right? Please, as we close, please read now, right? Our only hope is the resurrection and the coming of our Lord. For if the dead rise not, all who have died in Christ are perished. If it were God's plan to renew the life of the sleeping saints in any other way except the resurrection, Paul would not say that then they which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. But Paul knew that the resurrection was the only gateway into eternity for all who had fallen under the cruel hand of death. Mm. So he concluded that the saints would either come forth in the resurrection or perish. Wow. And so, dear friend, the resurrection at the return of Jesus is our only hope. And it is Christ who makes the resurrection to eternal life possible. He possesses immortality. Christ is the fountain of eternal life. If we are to live with those who have died victoriously, we must anchor our faith in him. Yes, in him. There is no other way to heaven. Amen, brothers and sisters. And we discussed the only two ways to get to heaven, brothers and sisters, either by resurrection or translation. And the vast majority of us who get to heaven will go there through resurrection. Only a faithful select few, the 144, whoever they may be, will have the privilege of going there by translation. Now, so once you've covered this, and again, we, and again there are several ways you could have, we could have taught this. But we wanted to keep it very, very simple, hone in on the text. That text, Ecclesiastes 9 to 5 and 6, man, is a powerful text. You can't believe that text and believe anything else. It is, it is a conflict, right? And that's why we tend to rip, I, we rivet that text and made it as simple as possible because these are people who don't know this. Now, obviously, once you finish, you always want to finish with your appeal. And it's very, very simple. 
Only two appeals. You, do you understand and believe what the Bible teaches about tonight's subject? And do you plan to follow it? Yes. Right? Now, is the information presented, was, was it not clear? Do you need clarification? And at this point, they, they will say this. Now, this is because it happened to me. See, I'm not telling you something. See, friends, I'm not you know, just teaching. I, I, I've experienced this. On numerous occasions, I've taught this Bible study to people. They say, Pastor, and I, I see it, I believe it, but, and the but now is where we're going to deal with in about two or three sessions. But, what about the thief on the cross? And it's a fair question. I can't say, but what? You yeah, idiot. You did Bible teach you already. Look at that, man. Look at that. No, you, you, you can't take that approach. But what about absenting body present with the Lord? But what about the souls under the altar? But what about rich man and Lazarus? But what about all these other texts, the which are endure? But, and so what happens now, you now as a teacher of the present truth must understand these texts in its context and be able to shed some light on these texts. And that is why now I have sought to include in the present truth series, brother, these supplementary lessons. Now they may not ask. If they don't ask, then guess what? I'm not going to divulge them, yeah? But if they do ask, I really want you to be ready, right? Um, I want you to be ready to, under, to explain these texts. And a good book you want to get is by Joe Cruz, Difficult, uh, Difficult Answers to Bible Texts, or Answers to Difficult Bible Texts by Joe Cruz. It's a good book. Amazing Facts puts it out. Get that book because what, what Joe Cruz does, he does give an explanation of all the texts, the ambiguous texts, especially the ones that may give credence and license to the fact that when you die, you're not dead. Even though I believe, you know what I'm saying? I remember, i give you a true story. I remember I was canvassing. While at Oakwood, I was canvassing in Orlando. And I was, I was around the, US, the University of Florida area, canvassing. And it was, a, it was getting late, and you know, you're kind of tired, so I wanted to see if I could sell one more great controversy. So when I knocked on the door, you know, of course, you, you had the pitch. But then I kind of deviated from the pitch. And I said to the lady, um, we're promoting this book called The Great Controversy. It, you know, it answers some of life's difficult questions, why there's so much suffering, you know, and what happens to a person when they die. I never forget it. And the lady said to me, Oh, that's easy. Absent in body, present with the Lord. I said, what? No, I was a field major, a senior. I said, what did you say? She said, yes. Friends, up until that point, I, have, I never knew that that text was even in the Bible. I'm, you know, the Apostle Paul was a very technical author. I like to work with Peter and John, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? But literally, the lady actually went in the home in her home and opened the Bible text, the first Corinthians, I think it was nine verse six. I think, don't quote me. And when she read it, I was flabbergasted. Friends, you know, I, she didn't even buy the book <laughs> because she thought that she knew the answer. I, I didn't even know how to come back, what to say. And I made it my mission from henceforth. You know, I'm not gonna be, I'm not going, by the grace of God, I will not be ambushed. I will not be caught off guard when it comes on these texts. So again, they may not ask you to explain them, but if they do, you need to be ready. And so by the grace of God, the next few sessions we're going to take and just, and just deal with these things to give you, friends, you know, we're not rushing. I'm in no rush. Yeah, I'm in no rush. Um, but we're trying to use this platform to really, you know, we want to do justice to these things. So as you go forth, you are mightily furnished in regards to the arena and the area of present truth. So if they ask, so next week, by the grace of God, we are going to, um, to, to deal with these topics, right? And then obviously, you want to close off with prayer, right? Okay, Luis Torres, okay, I'm, I'm reading, it says, Luis Torres um, also has a book called Bothersome and Disturbing Bible Passages. All right. 
um, Maria Gittin. Never heard about that one, but thank you very much, right? I'm going to definitely look into that one because I, like I like to have ammunition, amen? And I know um, Luis Torres is a, a terrific um, evangelist. He has a school, Black Hills. I don't know if it's still in operation, but it's a good school to learn, to go and learn, right? But definitely, right? Thank you for that. And we can share in the group, right? And then you'll close off, and then now you'll get ready now to go into the next session. Now, friends, I hope you were blessed. I hope you were blessed by this evening's study. And again, there's so much ways we could have taught it, but I really wanted to keep it very, very simple, not too complicated, because you're dealing with people who are not familiar, especially. And these are people who have been, man, they have sung, Ellen White said they have sung it, they have prayed it, they have preached it. It's in their very, very fiber. So you come with something else now, you, you, you're just disturbing the whole cerebral, right? But we want to make it very, very simple. And even when you teach it, we encourage you guys to be, not to be joking. I know some, you know, we were teaching it, but listen, we, we want to teach it very, very reverently because they do believe that their parents are in heaven. We don't want to make light of their belief because, you know, people hold to this thing very dearly. And people find solace in that. But at the end of the day, God doesn't want anybody to comfort themselves in deception, right? Neither are we to perpetuate them. But so as you teach it, friends, be mindful that they may have a loved one who just passed. They may have just funeralized their, their child. Yeah? So when you teach it, you be, be, you know, be, be, be like Jesus. Yeah? Be sympathetic. Be understanding. But at the same time, you want to affirm truth. Yeah? And you want to comfort them. Yes. Not in the fact that their loved ones are conscious, that if we are faithful, we will see our loved ones again. And when Jesus comes, he will reunite us with our lost loved ones. And we'll either be reunited in heaven or be reunited in hell. Now, you're not going to tell them that part, right? But So you're not lying. We will be reunited. And we will see our loved ones again, right? Either you're going to see them outside the city or inside the city. But rest assured, we will see them again, right? So on that note, again, I just want to encourage you guys to, um, to be mindful, right? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. Thank you. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. We're going to cover that one, right? So stay tuned. And, um, and we want to thank you guys for logging on tonight. We had, a, we had a little late start because of the technology. But again, we thank everyone in the chat group. You know, listen, man. It is a, it, 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 I listen, I deem it a privilege um, for you to entrust me with an hour of your time. I, I don't take it lightly. I know there's there are several things you could be doing right now. I Many you have children and work and life. So for you to be faithful to come on every Sunday night to entrust me to your time, I, I treasure that. And that's why I'm not here to play games. We're trying to I want to maximize the time I spend with I spend with you, right? And I, I, I know that we're not able to to um answer questions. Um someone was suggesting why don't you use Zoom, the Zoom platform, so people can ask questions. But if we do that, we'll be there all night. You know what I'm saying? We'll be there all night. And you know, my kids have to go, go to bed and so forth. Right? But um, reach out to me. If you have a question, reach out to me. I'm available. Email me, call me. I'll do my best. Right? And again, friends, whatever I teach and preach, I, I want to put out a disclaimer. Only God and heaven alone is infallible. Yeah? And so if I make a mistake, it's not intentional. I'm not, I'm not here trying to deceive people. I am no heretic or... Amen. Right, that, that, we're, and we rebuke that spirit. We're here trying our trying to do our best with my little my little two cents. You know what I'm saying? And I was never the sharpest or the brightest on the shelf. You know what I'm saying? So, but I thank Lord for allowing me to be a part of this. And every day I ask Him, Lord, make me a teacher like Philip after the divine order. And that is my prayer for you. As we seek not just to watch, to wait, but to see to work for the coming of Jesus. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you, mighty God, again, for just this platform. We thank you, Lord, for every soul that logged on tonight and for those who will watch this broadcast a little bit, Father. This is such an important doctrine and we need to understand it, the ins and out, the text that may be ambiguous, Lord. We, so please, Lord, help us and not just understand it, May we stay clear of anything that border spiritualism, the occult, or even any kind of communication, even with the dead. The dead are, in, are sleeping and they are unconscious, and that's where we want them to be. We thank you again, and we pray you'll give us all a good night's rest. Um, tonight, Lord, 
as the faces differ, we know each person in this chat group has a struggle. I have a struggle. Some sin, some habit that we are, we are, we've got down from our, the Abraham syndrome, Lord, a generation has passed down, and Lord, and we need victory over these things. So I pray victory that you will teach us how to fight the good fight of faith, to fast, to pray, and to arm ourselves with scripture so when we are tempted, Lord, we can gain the victory. Maybe those tonight, Lord, who are unemployed in the chat group, provide for them. The sick, the shut in, Lord, make a way, dear Father. But above all, may you save us at last in thy kingdom. And as we are on our way to heaven, help us to endeavor to take somebody with us, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, saints that are living God, we want to say um, a, a good evening to everyone in the chat group. I don't want to start calling names. James, Wiggins, Bryant, Kemptum Alert, Zaran, Elus, Rick, Charmaine, Big up yourself. Big up yourself, everybody in the group, right? I um, hope you have a wonderful week. This is a Sutherland, the Wellington crew, the Jamaican crew. Big up yourself, right? And you pray for me while I pray for you. As of always, we say in the words of the ancient Job, saints, behold, the eye forward.